Hello, my name is Brian Bowen and welcome to Apologetics 101. Today, we're going to start a brand new series. We, we're in two other series that I'm still working on. And I'm still going to continue working on that. In fact, I might even do one of them this Friday. Um, more on that in a minute. But right today, we're going to be doing a series, starting a new series on alleged contradictions. I've been wanting to do a series like this since almost since the time I started this channel. I've been promising it over and over in several videos. Things kept coming up, more stuff started coming up. I ended up not being able to get to it. Finally, I'm getting to it. <laughs> I said, I wanted to get to this. Um, I wouldn't say that alleged Bible contradictions and is super mm, I guess you can say it's important because it's the Bible and, and that sort of thing but at the same time uh, uh, the foundation of Christianity isn't somehow rocked over it because um, Christianity is not based on inerrancy it's based on uh, uh, a crucified Messiah that had risen from the dead and that's the focus point of the gospel as well so it's not it's important, but it's not foundational. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it doesn't affect a foundational issue involving Christianity. I don't think anybody thinks that it does. But in any case, um, it is, is kind of important in a way because it deals with the Bible. And, and one of the things the skeptics have constantly said and brought up is that they believe that there are uh, supposed contradictions. When you search for contradictions on the internet, uh, you find sites for anywhere from 400 to 40,000. Uh, there's one site that had 40,000 of these uh, uh, alleged Bible contradictions at one time. Um, most a lot of times they're just repetitions of each other and that sort of thing. And, and sometimes they're fabrications and so they can get more. And a lot of times these alleged Bible contradictions are elephant hurdles at us. If you don't know what elephant hurdle, hurling is, it's a, it's a debate tactic to try to throw as much at you as possible. The idea is to try to win the discussion by uh, uh, quantity rather than quality. In other words, they're not trying to win because the arguments are good, because they know it's good. A lot of the stuff that they throw up, a, a lot of the skeptics, and even Bar Ehrman sometimes admits, yeah, not really good, and there might be ways to reconcile it, but we're just going to go with believing that they're contradictions, even though they're not even true contradictions. And most of them are just easily, easily... Uh, 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 to reconcile once you consider other information and and a lot of times they're not even I think most of them are not even uh, 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 even apparent contradictions because they uh, the difference is definitely but they're not parent contradictions omission of a detail and an addition of a detail doesn't mean it's at odds with one another so this will be the first part of the series and we'll be talking about birth narratives that's what we're going to be basically focused on uh, we're going to deal with other alleged contradictions in other uh, uh, videos. Um, I think my next one is going to probably have a series of count alleged contradictions. This one's mostly focused on birth narratives, and it's the beginning of a series, so I'm going to be talking about certain ground rules that we're going to uh, have during this entire series and how we're going to be looking at these supposed contradictions and so forth. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm thinking about doing some, some stuff differently. Um, I'm thinking about trying don't try to hold me to it too much because I usually have a lot going on it's really hard to commit myself to a specific day and the way I've been doing the videos is that whenever I want to make a video I make it and I try to get as many videos out in a week time if I can sometimes I can only do once a week sometimes I have to skip a week sometimes you know I, I can do you know two or three in a week I plan on doing one uh, by this Friday hopefully um, if I can um, and of course, I got another channel that I'm also working on and things like that. And I get pretty busy. And so um, I'm thinking about trying to commit myself, trying to dedicate it. So I'm going to be difficult to do. I'm going to try to commit myself to doing the videos once a week on a specific day. Um, at least once a week. Now, I might do it multiple times a week, but at least this day I will definitely try to get a video in. And of course, it also depends if I have any technicalities. You know, if things don't come up and, and, and uh, upload speed, um, sometimes the up the, the speed is slow on my end on my internet, or it's slow, sometimes it's slow on YouTube because they got a lot of traffic, and sometimes it might not get uploaded until the next day. But hopefully, 
I'll try to get it in Friday if I can. Like I said, it's, it's going to be difficult to try to commit to that, but I'll see. I might not even be able to do it right off the bat, but we'll see. I plan on making another video this coming Friday. I think uh, I'm going to be doing, it's either going to be when skeptics respond, and that's if I don't decide to do another video, hit my Bart Ehrman series, because I got a Bart Ehrman series right now, and I think the next one's going to be on his historical methodology, because he has a very flawed historical methodology, and I want to deal with that, and, and the way he brackets people when he does consensus, and, and things like that, and um, uh, I might throw in some of the top fallacies that I think Bart does during his uh, discussions too, that might help people out in in uh, critically analyzing the kind of material that Bart likes to bring to the table. And we're going to be talking a little bit about Bart because he's very famous for these alleged contradictions and things like that as well. So let's uh, get right to it. Uh, let's begin now. That's right, we're going to be doing alleged Bible contradictions, and today we're going to start with the birth narratives. We're not going to be doing the uh, uh, resurrection narratives yet, I think that might be my next video. Um, we're not going to be talking about the genealogies, I'll probably put that one, because I'm going to have a, a video that's going to have the most popular uh, uh, alleged contradict Bible contradictions in it as well. And I'm probably going to save that for a, a later video, so we're not going to deal with the genealogies. Um, Specifically, when we say birth narratives, we're going to deal with, you know, when Jesus was born and, and, and the narrative that followed after that. You know, like when Matthew uh, tells us that uh, Joseph had to flee, they had to flee to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod, uh, or the census that, uh, that Luke reports was around the time of the birth of Jesus and that sort of thing. That's what we call birth narratives. And we're going to talk more about that, too, as we get. Before we do, though, before we do, we need to get set some ground rules down, okay? These ground rules will help us and guide us in understanding how, um, how uh, uh, we should, as Christians, uh, review this situation involving alleged Bible contradictions. All right, we're going to talk about some ground rules here. All right, well... Um, the first one is the burden of proof is on the skeptic. That's right, Christians. We don't actually have the burden of proof. They do. They actually have the burden of proof. Historical methodology dictates, and we'll talk about this in here in a little bit because that's the second rule. But we're going. Uh, uh, the um, historical methodology is that a source is innocent until proven guilty. Okay. In other words, the historian, professional historians, give the source the benefit of the doubt. Now, there are different people with different methodology. Historical, met, uh, historical, uh, or, or critical historians might have different methodology in how they do things, and so a lot of them might presuppose the source is guilty and proven innocent. This is typically not the way mainstream historians approach documents, and even those who do approach documents that way, where they assume they're guilty and to prove an innocent, can't do that consistently. Uh, take Bar Ehrman, for example. I consider him a, a critical historian. I don't know if he considers himself that. He calls himself a historian. But he seems to fit more in with a critical historian, the way he practices history. Um, but uh, Bart will... Um, Bart argues for the... Uh, um, that, uh, like, if he's arguing for a particular source, like let's say Josephus, and he, he and I'm talking about his published works. I got some of his books over there, and I've seen him do this. 
Like, if he says that, he'll give Joe Simpson the benefit of the doubt. Most of the time. Until he gets on passage he says he doesn't agree with. When he says he doesn't agree with that passage, you know what Bart does? He gives X amount of reasons why he thinks that passage is wrong. Why doesn't he say, well, it's wrong because there's no historical evidence that says it's right? Why doesn't he say that? Because he's giving benefit doubt to Josephus. Unless he has reasons for thinking that it's wrong or inaccurate. That's the only way he would do it. So they can't consistently apply this kind of methodology where they just assume that the uh, uh, source is guilty to prove it innocent. But they do kind of have a double standards when it comes to the Bible and when it comes to other sources. When it comes to other sources, their standards are different. When it comes to the Bible, they have a different set of standards for it. And that's ultimately what it comes to. And a lot of times they presuppose that these uh, are, are errors and contradictions rather than demonstrating it. How do they know if they're errors? Even if one is true, and one or if one's a contradiction, the, that don't mean they're both errors. Even if one was wrong, the other could be right. How do you know, you know that it's not wrong? Why do they just jump to something that they're all wrong? See what I'm saying? They're presupposing their guilt. Which leads us to the second rule, the Bible is innocent until proven guilty. The, that's not the skeptic's motto. The skeptic's motto is, Bible is guilty to prove an innocent. They automatically assume and presuppose that the Bible is not true. And but here's the thing: this is this one is kind of important because they are skeptics. I've seen Bart Ehrman does this, and, and a lot of other skeptics do it as well. I've seen Dan Barker do it, and others. They try to force their presuppositions onto the us. Bart Bart is bad about doing this because Bart says that. Barbara says that he doesn't think that that, uh, that you can really apply proper historical methods or, or be objective unless you assume his presupposition, namely that the Bible has mistakes in it. If you don't think the Bible has mistakes in it, then you can't be objective. Except the mistake, the, the burden of proof is not on me, it's on him. He has to demonstrate that there's errors. I'm not going to presuppose that they're errors before they're even demonstrated. That's not how this works. And if Barman is listening to this, it's not how it works. The way it works is that you have to demonstrate that they're errors. Okay? The Bible is innocent into proving guilty. And all harmonization efforts, which we'll get into in a little bit, are just a, a, a way of understanding that I'm giving benefit of doubt to the source. I am giving benefit of the doubt to the source. I'm not just simply assuming that the Bible has to have errors in it, the way critics do, the way skeptics do. Um, also, these uh, uh, harmonization efforts also act as philosophical defeaters. We'll talk more about that throughout this video, but philosophical defeaters are simply a way of defeating the idea, put it through another way, these, these Alleged Bible contradictions commit what's called the either or fallacy. Um, either or fallacy is when you say that either this is true or this is true, when there could be you know, a third option or so. Now, sometimes that is the case if the two points directly contradict. So, if they were actually right and these were two that could not be reconciled, that it was two odds, then it is possible that 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 uh, uh, that there could be errors or whatnot, or contradictions. But if there is a third possibility, which is what a philosophical defeater does, it defeats the idea that the error is the only logical answer. That's just not the case. All right. So this is these act as philosophical defeaters. So the Bible is innocent to prove and get guilty. Let's go to the third rule. An error in a, a later manuscript does a uh, copy. Later manuscript copy does not equal an error in the original. That, that means that, from a textual critical standpoint, if we have manuscripts, and we have good evidence for the manuscripts, and we know that a particular point doesn't go back to the original text, you can't point to that and say that's an error. You know, the error is in the manuscript copy, not in the original. Even in case of doctrine of inerrancy, we think that, that the originals are inerrant. And inspired. We don't claim that the copies are. So even if you find an error in the copy, 
Or if you claim that something's an error, they find it way to a Bible translation or something like the King James, and we know that that translation, that translation, and or, or that that uh, particular, the, the manuscripts that the translation is based on has a textual error that's widely recognized as not going back to the original text because of the manuscript evidence, then that's not an error in the original. So it would not be a contradiction. It wouldn't even be an error. It'd be an error in a manuscript, yeah, but not in the original. Remember, if you're going to say Mark was wrong about something, then we have to know what Mark said. Therefore, that's what textual critical analyzation is all about, what textual criticism is all about. All right, number four. Complementary details are not errors. What this mean? What what this means is that there are if if a, an account gives us more or further information, and another account omits the information. We'll talk more about omission of the information here in a little bit. But if one account gives us more information than another, then this is not a contradiction. In order to be contradiction, both of them have to make a statement concerning that, and they have to be at odds. And we'll get more into that here in a minute because I'm going to give you a definition of contradiction here in a few minutes. But they have to be at directly at odds. If they're not directly at odds, if one account is just missing and the other account adds it, there's nothing there to be directly at odds with it. So complementary information is not an error. It's, a, it's further revelation. It's further information. That's all that is. Number five. Omission of details are not a denial of the detail. What does that mean? It means skeptics often act like if, if one account omits something, then that account is denying it happened. Well, John only says there was only one woman there. He, but John doesn't say that. John never uses the word only or just. And you'll hear that word. We'll get more into that as time goes on because skeptics have a way of wording it to make it look like they're butting heads when they're not. The fact that it omits account, we're, we're actually going to go into that because Bart actually, Bart Ehrman, in, in his book, uh, uh, Jesus Interrupted, I have his book right here, and uh, he actually thinks that, he'll, he'll argue at one point in the book about uh, Matthew on the birth there, just Matthew having the, uh, uh, the flight to Egypt and it's missing in Luke and he'll talk about what's in Matthew that's missing in Luke, what's in Luke that's missing from Matthew and he'll act like these are at odds with one another. They're not at odds. <laughs> Omission of a detail is not the same as error. It's not an error. It's not a denial of the detail. They're not denying that the event took place. Alright, here's another one. Uh, uh, number six, addition of details does not mean such details are exhaustive. What this means is that the fact that there are that um, that we have information in a particular document. Sometimes skeptics will argue from silence, like uh, Bart will do that with I am sayings and John, and say, "Well, they're not in the synoptics, therefore that must Jesus must never said nothing like that." Except John's gospel isn't exhaustive, and neither are the synoptics. The fact, so you can't sit there and, and, and treat the Gospels like they're exhaustive treatises of everything Jesus said and did. And so you can't sit there and argue something like that. Because uh, a lot of times that, what that does is leads people to arguments from silence, which are inherently weak arguments. We'll get more into that as we progress. All right. Number seven, harmonization efforts are not bad historical methods, nor does it mean one must take upon themselves the skeptic's presuppositions, which is now being forced upon him or her. I dealt with this already a little bit. Uh, they do have a tendency to try to force their presuppositions about uh, the Bible being guilty and proven innocent, and that the, the accounts are counter, hopelessly contradictory instead of actually looking at the information. And Bart Ehrman is bad about making you think that harmonizing them is a bad thing. You don't harmonize them. He has this argument. I found it. I think it's in um, Jesus Interrupted. I don't know if it's in some of his other books, maybe. Um, where he actually says this. And I've tried and tried to find that quote. I could quote find it. But uh, basically, and he said this in debates too. 
He thinks that if you harmonize them, you're creating your own gospel. And he said this. He said this before. Not the case. Not the case. What it is is he's assuming that they're they're at odds with one another, and therefore you're creating. A, uh, he's assuming his position. Uh, harmonization is actually the standard for uh, 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 historians and scholars, and even classicists that are looking at uh, different accounts that have differences in them. And I mean, uh, and they they. And what they do is they harmonize these differences, if they can. If they can't harmonize it, the best a scholar does, throw up the shoulders and say they don't know how to reconcile those differences. They're considered, irre Excuse me. they're considered irreconcilable differences. That's what they're called. They don't even call them contradictions. They don't call them errors. Why not? Because they don't know if they're errors. They could be. It's possible they could be errors. And we'll get into that in a little bit because we're fixing to show you some definitions. It's possible they could be errors, but we don't know. And so the best the historian can do is say, regardless of peripheral details, we just don't know. So harmonizations are not bad. Now there are some extreme examples of harmonizations. Sometimes Bart will point to these extremes, but there's a lot more moderate uh, forms of harmonizations that are much more... Um, uh, conservative, much more restrained, etc. So, uh, trying to point to extreme examples and then argue that all harmonizations are bad is just faulty reasoning. All right. Eight. The presence of literary devices or conventions does not mean that such liberties are errors. Rather, they should be viewed in light of how ancient literatures were written at that time and is therefore viewed in light of situational liberties that is taken by the writer to uh, properly communicate their information with more clarity while working off their current limitations. Let me explain that one. Basically, uh, the, the, the Gospels are considered Greco-Roman biographies the Book of Acts is considered um, uh, considered uh, a historiography. At least that's how uh, Luke is writing it, like a uh, like a historical treatise. Um, uh, and he and that's how it's understood. And because of that, there are certain types of conventions, literary devices or literary conventions, in which the writer is using. We'll get more into defining that in a little bit but that the writer is using when they're writing the gospel or in the case of the book of Acts. Um, Matthew is not going to be writing his gospel and say, you know something, I'm going to write it according to literary convention that won't be invented or according to standards that won't be invented for another 2,000 years. He's not going to do that. He's going to write again, uh, He's going to write according to standards that he knows about. That's true in his day. That's what he's going to write according to. And the only fair way, as historians, for us to be able to, to uh, review his work and judge his work by is by the standards that he would be aware of. He wouldn't be aware of our standards. He'd be aware of his standards, the standards that was true for writing in his day. All right. Now, here's another biggie. I didn't write these, um, these ground rules in, uh, uh, in order of priority. Okay, some of these that are even toward the end are really important. This one's a really big biggie because it's 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 one that 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 I feel like that a lot of people uh, assume with these alleged contradictions because they assume that they, it, they if they're not precise enough, then it must be an error. Precise precision has to do with exactness. You know, being very specific. You know, if I say there's 500 people here today, but you know there's 573 people here today, and you say, well, it's 573 people here today, not 500, I'm obviously rounding down. I'm not trying to be exact. I'm not trying to be specific about the uh, how many people are there. I'm just rounding down to the nearest hundred. And that's allowed even in our modern culture. But in ancient times, they did it a lot more. I don't know why our culture has gotten more about precision than it used to be. But in ancient times, 
precision wasn't their focus point, wasn't their aim. And so they weren't trying to be precise. And a lot of times, skeptics will view lack of precision as an error. That they think that Jesus' words have to be recorded verbatim, or, or they have to uh, 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 be exact on their numbers, or exact on the specifics of the information that they, you know, they can't round it, they can't estimate, they can't approximate, they can't abbreviate, they can't summarize, they can't do all these things. But in fact, they do. And so, a skeptic says, "Oh, it must be an error." No, lack of precision is not an error. Now, number ten. <coughs> the existence of, or even the possibility of, errors, differences, contradictions, parent contradictions, or even irreconcilable differences do not make the core details that are agreed upon wrong, nor does it make a small few of them make the source in question unreliable. Now, this is too is important because a source could have differences, a source could have differences in it, and still be reliable about the core information that the peripheral details are surrounding. Um, there are three accounts that we have for the fire in Rome in AD 64. Tacitus, Suetonius, and Dio Cassius. All three are considered incredible historians. Tacitus is considered the greatest of all Roman historians. Uh, Suetonius is considered the most accurate of all Roman historians. And Dio Cassius is considered a very reliable historian that wrote an entire treatise over the Roman or the history of the Roman Empire. Okay, these three are all access to Roman records. Two of them, uh, Tacitus and Suetonius, were writing very early second century and lived in first century. They had lived in first century to the early second century, and they wrote about the fire in Rome in AD sixty four. And they got and they differ with each other on it. Anything from the extent of the fire. You know, uh, one account says all of Rome was destroyed. Another one says most of it. One, another one says portion of it. I mean, and, and uh, they differ on Nero's involvement. I think Tacitus said that, that, that he thinks that Nero was uh, the one that start, uh, started the fire and wrongfully blamed the Christians. And the Suetonius said no. Uh, 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 Nero had a, a, a uh, alibi and was too far away to have started the fire. But which is it? I mean, some of these differences are even irreconcilable. But nobody ever points to this as, oh, well, then I guess the fire the uh, fire in Rome didn't happen. Eight, uh, Rome didn't burn to the ground in AD 64. It never occurred. They can't even agree on all the minor details. No, because the core details of what they all agree on. <laughs> so th th that's just not the case. And we can go on and on about other examples of that. But obviously, historians don't just throw out the baby with the bathwater. They acknowledge that the core details, even if there's uh, peripheral differences, you know, differences in the peripheral details, the core remains the same. All four Gospels agree that Jesus died by crucifixion. All four Gospels agree that Jesus rose again from the dead. All four Gospels agree that he uh, uh, prophesied and, and worked miracles. I mean, uh, one miracle, particularly uh, the feeding of the 5,000, is found in all four Gospels. They all agreed with the empty tomb. And so, this idea that somehow we got to throw out the baby with the bathwater is just not the case. Or that, that we have to assume that the Gospels are going to be historically unreliable if they have these differences in it. Uh, anytime you have multiple perspectives, you're all going to have differences in it. In fact, these differences help us know that these guys didn't get together and collude with one another and just made up the story. The fact that there's differences tell us that they did not, uh, uh, that they were not inventing things. And that actually boosts the reliability of the Gospels. Knowing that they check things out or that, that it's being told from four different perspectives. If we only have one Gospel, we have less knowledge about Jesus. With four Gospels, we have a much more well-rounded, much more complete knowledge about Jesus. Now, I said more complete. We still don't have a complete picture. I mean, obviously, there are things that we that are not in the Gospels. that are true about Jesus. That might be true about Jesus. We don't know about. I mean, uh, that's just the case. So it wouldn't help to try to argue from silence or or something like that. <coughs> the Gospels are not intended exhaustive. John's Gospel actually ends toward the end of his Gospel. He actually made the statement that um, that Jesus said and did more than what was in his Gospel. But he says that. 
if if they were all written down, all the uh, books of the world would not contain them, which is a very poetic expression. He's basically saying, I'm limited on space, and I just don't have enough space in the scroll, because that's what they're writing them on. They're writing them on one side of the scrolls, and I'll have, and they can only fit like 40,000 words on the scroll. Uh, don't, don't think of a scroll like, like, you know, like this. It's actually much bigger. But it's got 40,000 words on it. They're very limited on how, uh, how much space they have to put on it. And so, John can't tell everything Jesus said and did. He wouldn't be able to have enough space to put it down. Uh, we see that happening when Josephus uh, is finishing up one of his books. Uh, he actually ends it <laughs> telling us that, that he's running out of room. And he will continue the next day over to the other, I guess the other scroll or something. All right. Let's get to some definitions. Alright, definitions. Alright, let's first we're gonna deal with the definition of a contradiction. What is a contradiction? The best definition of a contradiction comes from one of the laws of logic. There are three laws of logic. There's the law of uh, uh, the law of identity, the law of exclusion middle, and the law of non-contradiction. Today, we're all going to be concerned with one of those laws of logic, and that's the law of non-contradiction. This is probably the most popular of those three, the ones that's most well-known of the three laws of logic. Sometimes it's called the law of contradiction, but most people call it the law of non-contradiction, which basically says something cannot be A and non-A at the same time in the same sense. All right? Uh, that, and that's perfect definition of a contradiction. So based on the law of logic, no, the law of non-contradiction, uh, it says um, uh, that it gives basically three elements to making something a contradiction. One has to be directly at odds, right? Got to be A and non-A. Can't be A and B. Can't be A, B, and C. It has to be A and non-A. They have to be directly uh, opposed to one another. The second thing it gives us is it's got to be at the same time. This is interesting. All right. I'll give you some examples of this in a second. But... And it can't be in the same sense either. It can be in different senses. All right. Say, let's like, say, um, if I told you that uh, that I uh, had a discussion with my wife this morning, or I, I got a phone call from someone today, and I also talked to my wife before I made this video, and I made a video today. Say, contradiction. No, I just gave you further information. Like, if I... If I told my, if I said my, uh, told somebody, I told my, uh, talked to my wife this morning, and I told another person I had a phone call this morning, I had to handle something, and that's what actually woke me up. Uh, and I also had, uh, and I told another person that uh, I made a video today. They said, and then they get together and they say, contradiction. No, it's not, because those are not at odds with each other. That's further information that's being in. Remember, complementary information. So it's not at odds with one another at all. Um, what if I told you I was both sitting here and standing here at the same time? Could happen. But what if I told you that I was uh, sitting here and uh, uh, today I had, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I had talked to my wife. And I told that all in one statement. I talked to my wife and I'm sitting here. Say contradiction. No, because I did those at two different times. If I did them at two different times, they're not contradiction. That's important because uh, later on we'll deal with some stuff. Uh, probably my next video, actually, because we're going to deal with some resurrection elders. And there's a few things along those lines where, you know, like like you know, did the women see Jesus far off, or do they get close to it? And you know, Jesus was on the cross for like three hours. So, you know, I guess they they think that the, the women didn't move at all, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, we're going to be dealing with some of those things. Um, but that's why I want to make sure you understand that that in order to be a contradiction, all three of these have to be the case, okay? Uh, what about the same sense? What if I told you I was sitting, sitting here and standing my own against the critics? Say, contradiction. No, because I'm not meaning the same thing. By sitting here, I'm talking about my physical posture, right? Where my body is physically at. If I say that I'm standing my ground against the critics, 
I'm obviously mean the context indicates what I mean by this sense that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about my physical posture. I'm talking about holding my own against the critic's objections. So obviously we're not meaning the same sense as the very result. So it has to be in the same sense. All three of these have to be the same. They have to be directly at odds. Two, they have to be in the same time. They have to be in the same sense. And they all three must be the case. If one's the case but the other two isn't, no. If two's the case but one, uh, third one isn't, no. It has to all the three be the case in order to be a true contradiction. This is why I say most of the examples that are usually given in the Bible, uh, from the Bible, are not actual contradictions. Most of them are complementary information. Some of them are apparent contradictions. We'll get into that in here actually in a little second or two because that's the next definition. Uh, some of them are apparent contradictions. Most of them are probably complementary information. Um, that uh, and but some of them are apparent contradictions. But we'll get more into that in a second. But uh, uh, what the critics are trying to do is they're trying to elephant hurl these objections at us. And it doesn't work very much. You only have a few difficult ones. And I'm not trying to make you think that, that none of these are, are difficult. There are some difficult ones to get through. Um, but the difficult ones are so far and few, you'll be surprised. I will, uh, most of these you'll, that, that you'll be looking at and stuff, they're not very good at all. <laughs> it, it's easy to see why they will be bad. They're very bad arguments. Uh, sometimes they incorporate arguments from silence and things like that. And so, obviously, these are bad. And, but there are some that are difficult, but they're not that many. And because they're not that many, it doesn't help the critic. If you're trying to elephant hurdle, to only have a few things to elephant hurdle with. Because the elephant hurdle, it doesn't really work at all, but if you're going to elephant hurdle, you have to have a lot of something. So they take a lot of these things, even the ones they know are bad, and they're throwing at us. But, yeah. So, I, and I've never seen an actual contradiction ever be demonstrated. So that's very important. But we'll see that in, in a little bit. Alright. Parent contradiction. A parent contradiction is something that seems like a contradiction when no further evidence has been introduced nor evaluated. That means it's a surface level reading of the text. And it looks like a contradiction. That means it looks, when no other information is evaluated, like it fulfills those two criteria for a contradiction. Now, it cannot be a parent contradiction until at least it looks like it, it, it fulfills those two criteria. This is why there are things that, that a lot of times, the uh, apologists will just dump everything that, that, that the critics throw at us as apparent contradictions. The problem, however, is it's not really contradictions. Complementary information is a contradiction. Uh, omission of a detail when another text uh, includes a detail isn't a contra uh, isn't contradiction either, because you have to have the points at either end to oppose one another, right? If, if one has the point and the other doesn't have the point, then it, it's not going to directly oppose each other because it just got information over here that this text doesn't have. That that's not the same as a contradiction. It wouldn't even be qualified as an apparent contradiction. But if no further information is gathered. Again, the critic wants you to not look this stuff up. He doesn't want you to dig deeper. Bart Ehrman tries to claim in his book, uh, Jesus Interrupted, he wants us to think about these things, but he doesn't really want us to think about these things. Because once you do think about these things, you realize that, that, that it's not quite like that, that he is saying. Because a lot of times the critics will word them in a way to make these alleged contradictions butt heads. And you'll see that in the birth narrative because Bart does it <laughs> a few times. He does it. He makes them look like they butt heads when they don't. All right. Difference. When we say difference, talk about the differences between two different sources. When information is something other than what it is in other sources of information. In other words, this source of information has information that this that differs either in wording or you know in content, context. You know, if, if it differs somehow, if it looks like a parallel account, but yet it differs with it, then that's a difference. Or if there's information that's either missing or added into an account. If, there, if this one has additional information and this one don't, it counts as a difference. Okay? It's a complementary difference, but it is a difference. All right, which brings me to my next definition, complementary difference. When a particular difference adds more information 
than what was there in, in another source uh, of information, therefore increasing our knowledge about a particular event, situation, or person. In other words, we're just getting flooded information about a particular event, situation, or person. It, it, it doesn't mean it's contradicting the other because the other doesn't have the text in there. So it can't contradict it. All right, let's go to the next page there, right here. Uh, irreconcilable differences. A, 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 an irreconcilable difference is a difference that cannot be reconciled with another account, a possible error. Now, with this one, it means that the difference literally cannot be reconciled. I mean, we could try all we want to to reconcile it, but it would sound really strange, and we just can't figure out how. Like with some of the uh, differences between the fire of Roma 864, are, are uh, uh, irreconcilable differences. Now, is it possible that it could be an error? Yes, that is a possibility. We don't know if it's an error. I'm not sure if there's a way to really know it beyond a shadow of a doubt, but it's possible that it could be an error. It is possible that it could be an error. Is it the only possibility? No. It's also possible that we might not have enough information to know for sure if it's an error. So, uh, but it is, but the possibility of error is still there. All right. Literary compositional device. A literary compositional device is a, a literary convention used in writing in a particular culture by which to communicate a truth in a way that either adds clarity to what is being conveyed or being conveyed in such a way where certain liberties must be taken to compensate for literary limitations that are being, situa being situationally imposed upon the writer in their particular uh, in that particular culture in which they are writing their work. We dealt a little bit about literary compositional devices. Literary compositional devices, I'm not going to go too much into literary compositional devices. Maybe I will make a video later on down the road about it. But basically they will include things like uh, um, telescoping, also known as time compression. Time compression is actually the technical name for it, but telescoping is another, uh, uh, like a nickname for uh, time compression. Uh, you ever seen those uh, old telescopes from the pirate movies and stuff? They collapse them down into a single unit. Basically, that's what time compression does. It, it just kind of collapses it all down and abbreviates the account. Um, and another one is spotlighting. Spotlighting is like, uh, sometimes it's called literary spotlighting. It's kind of like when you're in a play and they shine a spotlight on some, uh, a particular person, persons, or scene. And you know other things are happening in the background. You can't see it because it's all dark everywhere else. But you know things are happening in the background. You're aware of other things back in the background. But they are focusing your attention on a particular person like the narrator or a particular group of persons like in a scene or something of that nature. Um, and that would be spotlighting or, or um, uh, literary spotlighting is sometimes called. Um, also, you got like displacement where you displace one. A particular event, scene, or, or, or um, teaching, or something in a different context. You're, you're displacing the event. This happens a lot in uh, uh, Plutarch's writings. A lot of these literary conventions can be found in Plutarch's writings as well. Um, Mike McConaughey's got a good book on it called uh, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels that go over these literary composition of devices. Um, another one is uh, uh, like. Um, in the case of transference, where they're transferring uh, the words or deeds to another, they're basically taking out the middle man and they're just uh, uh, replacing it with who it ultimately comes down to. Uh, we'll see that as time goes on as well. We'll get more into these literal compositional devices. I don't, I'm none of those people, you know, because you got people that they only does harmonization efforts, you got people that only use literary composition devices, and then you got people that use both. I love the later group. I use both. Uh, homization efforts and literary compositional devices. I'm sort of in between these two viewpoints. Um, I, I think that uh, that the Gospels are composed or can be harmonized easily for the most part, and there are literary compositional devices that can explain much of it as well. Because this is, after all, ancient literature, and we need to know how they wrote back then and so forth. Um, all right, let's go to our next uh, page. Okay, this is the last definition. All right, harmonizations. I, I deal with this a lot. The harmonizations, the act of harmonizing complementary or differing details between sources 
granting the sources the benefit of the doubt. That means I'm not presupposing that they're guilty to prove innocent. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt, uh, uh, assuming that they're innocent to prove guilty the way historians approach documents, and then I'm going to uh, harmonize these things. As I already mentioned, this is the standard approach that many historians and classicists often do with works with differences. If the differences can't reconcile, it's an irreconcilable difference. It's possible that it's an error, but we just don't know. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. All right, let's get right into this. This, this is, uh, um, we're gonna start with the birth narratives in Matthew, because it's basically a, it's, it's contrasting the birth narratives in Matthew and Luke, okay? All right, uh, Matthew says, but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Um, verse 20, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child, because Herod was trying to, to kill uh, all children under two. He says, uh, bring the child. Uh, and, and they were in Israel, Egypt. All right, this is the one that uh, I mix those up. All right, um, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. Verse 15. And remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Alright. But when Herod died. This is still Matthew. But when and Herod died. Uh, behold an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Saying rise take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life were dead. And this is after the death of Herod. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that uh, Archelaus uh, uh, was um, uh, reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. Uh, verse 23, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would, would be called a Nazarene. Uh, that's Matthew 2, 19 to two, uh, 23, uh, ESV. All right, now that's Matthew's account. This is Luke's, okay? In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration, we'll get more into that in a little bit. First registration when Quirin, uh, 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 Quirinius was governor of Syria. Verse 3, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David. Uh, five, verse 5. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Luke 2, 1 through 5. Okay. Got another one. Alright. Verse 22. And when the time came for their purification. Now this is after the birth of Jesus. It says, when it came time for the purification according to the law of Moses. There was a law uh, a, uh, uh, to purify the child. After birth, it has to do with circumcision. They were circumcised after the, uh, uh, the on the eighth day. Um, and, and well, it explains this in the text. Uh, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse twenty-three, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, 
a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Verse 39. And when, notice this, I want you to pay attention to some of the uh, some of the time indicators because this is going to be important later because certain words are going to be uh, claimed by some of the skeptics like Bar Owen that doesn't say. It doesn't say immediately. Notice this. It says, and when, talking about sometime after they did this provocation ritual, they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord that returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Alright. Now, let's uh, uh, see a quote by Bart Ehrman. A careful comparison of the two accounts also shows internal discrepancies. One way to get to the problem is to ask this. According to Matthew, what was Joseph and Mary's hometown? Your natural reaction is to say Nazareth, but only Luke says this. Matthew says nothing of the sort. He's arguing from silence. He first mentions Joseph and Mary, not in connection with Nazareth, but in connection with Bethlehem. Okay? In other words, he's saying that this difference matches up into a contradiction, but it's not. It's a, he says it's at odds because he's presupposing that Matthew is wrong and Luke is wrong. Or one or two. Alright. Here's another quote from Barman. Alright. So Joseph and Mary are still living in Bethlehem months or even a year or more after the birth of Jesus. What makes him think that that was that the case? Did Matthew say that? No. Matthew didn't say that. Let's look at what Matthew says again. And when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and rise, take the child and mother, and flee to Egypt. Okay? Let's see. Saying, rise, take the child and mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who saw the child alive are dead. Alright. Uh, this was after there. Alright? Uh, uh, following, uh, following Herod, uh, or following Herod's death. They were told to leave Egypt. Okay? So here's what Bart's basically assuming. Okay, they had to go to Egypt to avoid that for two years. Right? So uh, Luke says, talks about them going to Nazareth for, or Galilee following the, the uh, uh, preparation sermon. And he says this is immediately after. That's what he says in this. Uh, I got a quotation. He says it's immediately after. It's not immediately after. He doesn't say immediately, does he? He says, and when? In other words, they left after the preparation term. Okay? They didn't actually, uh, 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 but they got redirected, right? They were going to, but they got redirected, according to Matthew's account. Luke never reports on the Egyptian account, but he does sit there and say that, at, that and when, He's talking about after the events, after the events of the preparation sermon. But does Bart assume that they just wind up in Galilee instantaneous? Is that what he thinks that uh, uh, that um, that uh, uh, Luke is trying to say? He's trying to say that uh, uh, that that they just click their heels like three times and 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 say no place like home and wind up in Galilee instantaneously. <laughs> No, <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, so this wasn't an instantaneous trip in the first place. They, it just talked about when they tr uh, left, okay? And and we don't know what the, the time frame was exactly. Um, it could be that they uh, had left and got detoured before they reached Galilee. This be after the preparation sermon, uh, preparation or the preparation uh, that they did, and, and dedicating their our child to the Lord. And they went, uh, had, and they were going to go there, but then they had to go to Egypt for a couple of years before going back to Nazareth. The the problem, however, is that it assumes that Luke is saying. Well, one thing it's wording it in a way that makes him money answer. Because uh, Bart actually does say that. 
Um, he says that, that uh, uh, he says that uh, so Joseph and Mary are still living in Bethlehem months or even a year or more after the birth of Jesus. So how can Luke be right when he says that they are from Nazareth and return there just a month or so after Jesus' birth? Did they say they returned there a month or so? After? No, no. Now what well, he's why he's assuming this is one reason because of preparation sermon. Uh, preparation thing that they, they make them wait a, a month and and Luke says that they left after that but the trip isn't instantaneous it's not like they left for or, or uh, Galilee and instantaneously wind up in Galilee or left for land of Israel and instantaneously wind up in Galilee I mean that's not the way it happened obviously it took some time and it's possible also that Luke might be time compressing some of the events uh, he's just taking the events and abbreviating them a little bit more um, but either way, he, uh, it's not uh, uh, a contradiction at all. And he goes further, he says, Moreover, according to Matthew, after the family flees to Egypt and then returns upon the death of Herod, they initially plan to return to Judea, where Bethlehem is located. They cannot do so, however, because uh, now Archelaus is the ruler, and so they relocate to Nazareth. In uh, Matthew's account, they are not originally from Nazareth, but from Bethlehem. The fact that they talk about them living in Bethlehem or living in Nazareth, because you can actually be from multiple cities. I mean, I'm, I, I, I can tell people that I'm, I live in Waverly. That's where I live, in Tennessee, Waverly, Tennessee. Uh, I am connected to Wa uh, Tennessee, uh, Waverly in Tennessee. I'm connected. I've been lived here since sixth grade, but I was born in Nashville. But I've also lived in Clarksville. Oh no, contradiction! How can I live in Nashville, Clarksville, and uh, 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 Bethlehem, or not Bethlehem, but uh, uh, and Waverly? Simple, because I've lived in all three. They're not at odds with one another. Um, if Matthew is right that the family escaped to Egypt, how can Luke be right that they return? directly to Nazareth. That's Berman, Jesus Interrupted, 2009, page 34. Uh, because they didn't say they directly uh, got to Nazareth. A lot of times they're using words like directly, immediately, things like that, that the text actually isn't even saying. Um, well, let's see another quote from Berman. He says, we have relatively good records. This is this is interesting. This is about this consensus involving Luke. Because Luke reports on there was consensus. Remember? Uh, he says, We have relatively good records for the reign of Caesar Augustus. And there is no mention anywhere in any of them of an empire-wide census for which everyone had to register for returning to their ancestry home. Now, this is an obvious... This is an obvious argument from silence.
We have relatively good records for the reign of Caesar Augustus, and there is no mention anywhere in any of them of empire-wide census for which everyone had to register for returning to their ancestry, ancestral home. <sighs> this is obviously an argument from silence. <laughs> the, uh, not having that doesn't mean that it didn't happen, obviously, um, but. He's going to get a little bit deeper into this, so I'm going to continue the quote. And how could, uh, how, uh, how, uh, I repeated that twice. How could such a thing even uh, be imagined? Uh, Joseph returns to Bethlehem because his ancestral uh, ancestor David was born there. But David lived a thousand years uh, uh, they lived a thousand year, years uh, ah, I miss some stuff here Joseph are we to imagine that everyone in the Roman Empire was required to return to their homes of their ancestors from a thousand years earlier why then does uh, Luke say there such a consensus uh, uh, the answer may seem obvious to you uh, he wanted Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, even though we know he came from Nazareth. Matthew did, too, but he got him born there in a different way. Bar Ehrman, Jesus interrupted, page 55. All right, let me deal with the uh, uh, census first. That light is just blinding. Uh, I hope my hat stays in the way. It's just really shiny. I have to ignore that light. All right. Now, uh, let's deal with the census first. Um, uh, obviously, this is an argument from science, but uh, we'll talk more about this in the connect quote because I think I got a quote from Burr that's going to go a little bit deeper into this uh, census. But this is obviously an argument from science. Even if that's the case, it's a the fact that, there, that we have no mention of it in history, we lost a ton of stuff from ancient history. So that that's really not a, uh, that's not proof that it's not true. That would not be proof that it's not true in the first place. Um, all right, what about this, the rest of that thing? That, that was just pure speculation right here. It says, by the end, because he wanted to, uh, 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 Jesus to be born in Nazareth. They both did, they just did it in a different way. What evidence does he have for any of that? None. It's speculation. It's 100% speculation. In fact, Bart speculates a lot in uh, Jesus Interrupted. Um, I actually, well, some of the stuff I actually uh, wrote down speculation. I don't know if y'all can see that or not. I actually wrote down when he speculated and stuff. Because he, Bart has a bad habit of mixing speculation with fact. He will talk about some good facts about the background of the Old Testament and stuff like that. Then he will sit there and mix that with speculation. And, and, and just things that are just totally speculative. The inclusion is speculative. You don't have no evidence for it at all. Uh, he's assuming things about their motives that he has no idea about. Um, for example, that they're both making up the birth narratives, for example, and they're not. Um, one account mentions information that another account doesn't mention. That's, that's obvious. But that don't mean they're making it up. Um,
But Barrow Man has a habit of doing that. He, he speculates a whole lot and mixes it in with some facts and, and tries to make you think that it's believable. But the reality is that he is speculating a lot on that. Um, the, the, by the way, what would he do about the fact that there's not only a prophecy, that there's a prophecy that says that he would be born in Na, uh, Nazareth. There's a prophecy that he would be born in Bethlehem. I mean, the only way to be consistent with that is to deny both of those. But Bart actually acknowledges that he was born in that, but Nazareth. And Bart thinks that that uh, uh, um, that Jesus being born in Nazareth, that they're that they're trying to make it look like he was born or born in Bethlehem, not Nazareth. Except he, the Bible doesn't actually say he was born in that in Nazareth. Only they lay lived there. And uh, so this is not evidence that that account is not true at all. All right. Um, I want to. Uh, 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 Yeah, uh, I want to talk about that consensus real quick because he says uh, I don't think I have it. I thought I did. I think I meant. Uh, all right. Uh, in, in another passage, I was gonna go here. I think this is might be it. All right. Uh, Josephus mentioned uh, Caesar Augustus. What about that that uh, difference between Caesar Augustus and uh, or the difference between the senses in uh, uh, Luke's gospel? A lot of times critics will say Luke's the only one who mentions it. The fact that Luke's the only one that mentions it doesn't make it not true. Um, Josephus is the only one who really mentions the destruction of Jerusalem in 1970. He's our primary witness to it. I mean, he was an eyewitness to that destruction. No one thinks he's not correct because he's the only witness or the only uh, uh, source we have. We've lost a ton of sources, so we don't know. So the fact that he's all, that Luke's the only one mentioned it doesn't make Luke wrong. doesn't make Luke incorrect. Um, it certainly doesn't make it an error just because others don't mention it. <laughs> so that's just, like I said, is an argument from silence. Now what about this thing about, okay, what about the senses? Uh, um, that uh, uh, this took place where the Quirinius was governor of uh, Syria. I meant to write that quotation down. I don't think I did. I got two more, and I think they're different than the one I was meant. But uh, the reality is, is that uh, Quirinius is likely to have uh, ran actually twice. Once, see, the census was taken about every 14 years, and you average it out when the census was actually taken according to Josephus which is roughly around 6 or 7 BC or 80 uh, and you average out by 14 that would put it almost at the, about the birth of Jesus I mean you have to give or take because we are estimating here but it, it happens every 14 years there's also another important uh, note to, to, to take that supports this uh, look at the uh, uh, Luke passage again Look what he says. He says, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. If there's a first, that implies a second, doesn't it? A second registration, a second census. The second census, so he, Luke must have been aware that uh, Quirinius had made another census later. Every 14 years, they make the census. All right, um, now I'm going to... Another thing on these alleged contradict Bible contradictions, a lot of times it's the way they're wording it. They're wording it in such a way to make them butt heads. Bart worded like immediately they went to Nazareth. No, it doesn't say immediately, does it? I mean, do they think the trip was instantaneous? I mean, <laughs> uh, this is what one skeptic had said uh, on a uh, site. He said, these lists are meant to identify, some of is a list of alleged contradictions. This is on infidel.org. It's by Donald Morton. He, he put together these, these lists of alleged Bible contradictions. I think there's supposed to be about 400. He says, these lists are meant to identify possible problems in the Bible, especially those that are inherent in a literalist or fundamentalist interpretation. I don't know what he would call a literalist or fundamentalist. Um, 
all, all Christians I know are recognized there were metaphors in the Bible and, and, and things like that. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what he calls a literalist. Um, but uh, I guess that, that the Bible should not be taken as true, I think is what he's trying to say. But that's incorrect. That's really, the, uh, the word fundamentalist has actually changed over time. Uh, what skeptics now call fundamentalists is not fundamentalists. Originally, fundamentalists was those who advocated foundational doctrines. Now it's more um, trying to say that they are uh, uh, about the, 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 the traditionalists, you know, and, and like King and Gonis, and they usually dump, uh, bump them all in the same category. But um, uh, in that sense, I'm not a, a fundamentalist. In the sense that they're using it, uh, you know, sometimes they'll throw up inerrantness in that calling, and they'll claim, "Now I'm a fundamentalist because I believe in inerrancy," but that doesn't make me a fundamentalist because, it, for one thing, inerrancy is actually not a foundational doctrine. It's an important doctrine, don't get me wrong, but it's not a uh, foundational doctrine in Christianity. You could be a Christian and not and reject inerrancy, and there are Christians that do reject inerrancy. So that does not make me a fundamentalist or not a fundamentalist to begin with. Um, all right, he goes by, he says, keep in mind, however, that what constitutes a valid problem is to some extent a matter of opinion. Um, this is a way of trying to put kind of like a, um, a, a uh, disclaimer on these uh, electric power countries because he uses a lot of really bad ones. All right, it says, you may disagree that these are in fact genuine biblical problems. Got that right. Uh, but it is the author's opinion that a perfect, now listen to this, a perfect and omnipotent God could, should, and would see to it that such problems do not exist in a book which he or she had to inspire, which it wouldn't be she anyhow. Um, <laughs> in other words, the atheist cannot even possibly think of a way to make it look like it's problematic. But that's just completely false. Um, because the reality is that they, if, they, if someone really wants a problem with something, they can invent one. I mean, the way that they word these things, it almost sounds like they're butting heads when they're not. And some of the stuff that he puts on the site is like that as well. Let me put a uh, 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 quote to you what he says on his site concerning the, uh, uh, um, the, uh, I think it's concerning the birth of the guy. Uh, yeah. All right. This is what he says about this. Following the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary flee to Egypt. It doesn't say it uh, follows it, because they did a preparation sermon before then, according to Luke. Um, but uh, it doesn't say following. Uh, I mean, it obviously had a, a, after, but it doesn't say immediately after. Where they stay until after Herod's death in order to avoid the murder of their firstborn by Herod. Herod slaughters all male infants two years old. Uh, old and under. Listen to what it said. Note, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, though under two, is somehow spared without fleeing to Egypt. How does he know that? The text never even mentions John the Baptist. He doesn't know what happened to John the Baptist. Maybe he fled to Egypt too. Maybe he fled somewhere else. <sighs> you don't know what happened to John the Baptist because they don't say. This is pure speculation. Alright, Luke 2, 22 through 40. Following the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary remain in the area of Jerusalem. For the presentation about 40 days that's correct and then return to nazareth without ever going to egypt speculation does it say they never went to egypt no it just doesn't mention the egypt trip but it doesn't say anything that they didn't go to egypt this is assumed by the critic there is no slaughter of the infants again another assumption did it say no slaughter of the infants? no it just doesn't mention it doesn't mean they're denying it. Remember, omission of details is not the same as a denial of that detail. So I hope you understand, when dealing with this, whether we're dealing with birth narratives, next time I'm thinking about doing the resurrection narratives uh, surrounding Jesus' resurrection and crucifixion and so forth, that some of the uh, uh, supposed contradictions are around. Most of these are like that. They actually word it in a way that makes them sound like they're butting heads. When in reality, they're not. And you actually view the, uh, the verse, you take the time to look at the verse, 
to look at the contacts, to considering background, work study, history, archaeology, uh, the, uh, the textual evidence from manuscripts. You start considering all these things and you start putting them together. And, and, and the, the skeptics are like, no, you can't do that. You're just making your own gospel. No, we're not. We are, are giving the benefit of the doubt. We're doing what historians do. We're giving the benefit of the doubt to the source. The Bible is not guilty of proven innocent. The burden of proof is on the skeptic. They have to demonstrate it's an error. Good luck with that one. But in any given case, uh, that's all for now. Uh, next time, we're going to be doing, uh, I think, resurrection narratives that we're going to be talking about. This Friday, I may have another video. It's probably not going to be related to this, this new series I've started. It's probably going to be uh, either When Skeptics Respond or another video in my Bart Ehrman series. But um, I will see you then. Thank you for watching. And don't forget to learn the facts the critics don't want you to know. This is Brian Bowen of Apologetics uh, 101 signing off. Yeah.